Hello, so I'm going to be moving myself around a little bit down here. Um, that way you can still see me, but still see all of the slide. Um, same thing with this as well. Um, just so I'm able to stop the presentation at the end. This is about the regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. It is an assignment for Grand Canyon University Biochemistry. Um, but if you find this helpful, I'm glad you did. And I hope it's helpful on whatever assignment you are working on. So let's get started on our objectives. So what we're going to learn here, what is glycolysis? What are the products? What are the actions, reactions? What is gluconeogenesis? Um, and what is the whole point of it? We're going to specifically look at the enzy enzyme Adelase, um, the isozymes of that enzyme and where they're expressed. And then we're going to look at the regulation of Adelase in our body. And so I'm going to move myself to this little spot here so you can still see me. So glycolysis is probably one of the most understood metabolic pathways. Um, it's responsible for breaking apart a six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules. So we're taking something made of six carbons and breaking into something with two carbons, uh, three carbons, my bad. And so more specifically, we're taking glucose and making pyruvate. Um, the breakdown of glucose is the sole source of metabolic energy um, and some mammalian tissues and some cell types, some plant tissues will use glycolysis um, to derive energy and many anaerobic microorganisms use glycolysis as the sole source um, of metabolic energy. Um, so it's very important. It's actually the first step of cellular respiration. So you may have heard of it before, maybe not quite in this much detail, um, but you may have heard the idea of glycolysis and its release of energy to create ATP. And so the splitting of glucose is going to occur in 10 steps, and we're going to split it into sets of five, just like on our hands. We have five fingers over here and five fingers over here, just like we have five steps over here and five steps over here. And so the first five steps are known as the preparatory phase. And for each glucose molecule that passes through the preparatory phase, we're going to get two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. I want you to remember that we're going to get two molecules of G3P at the end, because that's going to be important here. Okay, so first what's going to happen is the glucose molecule is going to be phosphorylated at the hydroxyl group on carbon 6 by the enzyme hexokinase. So here we have ATP giving up a phosphorus with the help of hexokinase to glucose, creating glucose 6 phosphate. The glucose 6 phosphate is then going to um, be converted into fructose 6 phosphate um, by the enzyme phosphohexoisomerase. Fructose 6 phosphate is then phosphorylated again um, at carbon 1, yielding fructose 1, 6 by phosphate. So we had a phosphate added at carbon 6 and a phosphate added at carbon 1, both times using ATP, giving up that phosphoryl group. Um, so we are using energy here, and we have created fructose 1, 6 by phosphate with the help of phosphofructokinase, which is an enzyme. Um, these, this is the rate limiting step of glycolysis, so we can only go as fast as we have ATPs available. Um, next, we've got our fructose 1,6-biphosphate, and it's going to now split into two 3-carbon molecules. So you'll notice down here in my picture, if I can find my pointer here, we have two molecules here, each one of these consisting of three carbons, 1, 2, and 3, right? What's going to happen is Adelase, an enzyme, is going to take fructose 1,6-biphosphate and split it in half. And now we're going to get these two three carbon molecules. The first one is glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate or G3P, and we're good. We're happy here. The next is dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And I told you, remember, at the beginning of this slide, I said we're going to get two molecules of G3P, not one molecule of G3P and another one of DHAP, which is the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So what's going to happen is dehydroxyacetone phosphate um, is going to be isomerized by triose phosphate isomerase to produce a second molecule of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So this is the lysis step of glycolysis. Gluco has been split up and we've got our two molecules of G3P. So what's going to happen now is we're entering in the payoff phase. That was the first five steps. Now we're in the next five steps. 
Remember, we used two ATP already. That is the prep phase. We had to put some energy in. Now it's the payoff phase. We're going to get something out of this. So both molecules of G3P are going to pass through the next five steps. So notice how you have two, two, and two, and two. Right? So that means it's going to happen twice. To start the payoff phase, each molecule of G3P is oxidized and phosphorylated by inorganic phos um, phosphate to form two molecules of 1,3-bi-phosphoglycerate. Okay. Next, the enzyme phosphoglycerate kinase is going to transfer um, a phosphoryl group from 1,3-bi-phosphoglycerate um, to ATP. And remember, this is two molecules of it, so it's going to happen twice. So we've created two molecules of ATP here. Yay, this is great. All right, so we had 1,3-bi-phosphoglycerate. We formed 3-phosphoglycerate, and now we've got 2-ATP. Um, phosphoglycerate mutase and a magnesium cation are required for the next step. So we're at number 8 here. And it's a reversible shift of a phosphoryl group. So all we're doing here is taking the phosphorus and moving it to a different carbon. That's all we're doing. So we're going to take the phosphorus off of carbon 3 and transfer it to carbon 2, producing 2-phosphoglycerate right here. Remember, we still have two of them. Next, enolase promotes the reversible remover of a molecule of water to form 2-phos... I'm sorry from 2-phosphoglycerate to produce phosphophenol pyruvate. So we have produced something known as PEP, phosphoenol pyruvate. Remember, we still have two molecules of this. The last step of glycolysis is um, catalyzed by pyruvate kinase. So we have PEP here, and we're going to use pyruvate kinase to catalyze this next reaction, which is going to initiate the transfer of the phosphoryl group um, from PEP to ADP. And remember, we still have two molecules of this. So we're taking two molecules of PEP, taking the phosphorus out, putting it on to ADP to create two more molecules of ATP. And so now that we have two molecules of ATP, the final product pyruvate um, then is going to tautomerize quickly into its keto form at a pH of seven. Um, and so now we have four molecules of ATP and two molecules of pyruvate. Remember, earlier we used two molecules of ATP um, to add um, phosphate groups to our molecules. So the actual um, payoff or net yield of glycolysis is two ATP for one molecule of glucose and two pyruvate for one molecule of glucose. Um, and it's regulated by the enzymes hexokinase, phosphofructokinase 1, and pyruvate kinase. So that is... Um, the overview of glycolysis. And so moving on to what is known as gluconeogenesis. So our bodies require a lot of glucose, um, some of which is stored as glycogen um, in the liver and muscles, um, but these stores are really not as sufficient as you might think. Um, if you think about how much energy is needed to help us um, maintain homeostasis um, and to function in between meals, maybe in a time of fasting, maybe you just did a really intense workout and your body needs to keep up with this energy demand, we're going to run through these glycogen stores pretty quickly. Um, and so this is why um, we're going to need this process of gluconeogenesis. Gluco means sugar, neo means new, genesis means to form or create. So gluconeogenesis is essentially the creation of a new sugar. So we're going to take our three carbon molecule right here. We have pyruvate, one, two, three carbon, and we're actually going to create a new six carbon molecule of glucose, right? So the reason I mentioned this diagram down here is, right, this is what we just talked about. We have glucose, our six carbon cyclic molecule. We put it through glycolysis, and now we have three carbons or two, three carbon molecules. Now we're going to take this and create a new molecule of glucose, um, so we are converting two, three carbon molecules into glucose. This is going to occur mainly within the liver, um, the renal cortex, and the epithelial cells of the small intestine. However, it is important to note that it is not just going to be the exact opposite reaction. Um, there are um, seven out of the 10 enzymatic reactions are 
um, the reverse reaction, same enzyme and everything. However, there are three reactions of glycolysis that are not irreversible, and we'll see that as we look at the steps of, of gluconeogenesis. So remember, we are making a new glucose. We're working backwards from the process of glycolysis. Um, and so I'm going to put myself down here and I'll have to move throughout the slide. So the first step of gluconeogenesis is the first bypass reaction or the first reaction that is not the same um, or the reverse from glycolysis. And it is the conversion of pyruvate to phosphoenol um, pyruvate or that PEP. And it's achieved by actually a roundabout reaction that we're gonna see down here um, that involves enzymes in both the cytosol and the mitochondria. Um, and so what's going to happen is pyruvate is going to be transported from the cytosol into the mitochondrial, into the mitochondria. Then um, pyruvate carboxylase is going to convert pyruvate to oxalocetate. So if you see on my slide here, the first real reaction is pyruvate to PEP, but we can't just do a direct transfer, right? We have to do this roundabout reaction here. So pyruvate enters the mitochondria and, become, and becomes oxalocetate which is fantastic. However, the mitochondrial membrane does not have an oxalocetate carrier, so we have a little bit of a problem. And so what's going to happen is oxalocetate is going to be reduced to malate um, by mitochondrial malate dehydrogenase um, using NADH. So it's like a reaction off a reaction. Afterwards, malate can leave the mitochondria where it's going to be oxidized back into oxaloacetate um, and now we can use our oxaloacetate and convert it to phosphoenol pyruvate um, using phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase or PEP kinase, carboxykinase. So now we have our two molecules of phosphoenol pyruvate. We are here now and we're going to use enolase again. So this is just the reverse reaction from glycolysis. Um, to create 2-phosphoglycerate. And so PEP is hydrated into 2-phosphoglycerate um, using the enzyme enolase. And then once again, that phosphoryl group is just going to be transferred from the 2-carbon to the 3-carbon. And so we're creating two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. 3-phosphoglycerate is then phosphorylated by ATP, so we're using energy here. Um, with the help of phosphoglycerate kinase to create 1,3-biphosphoglycerate. So we've added that phosphate group. Let me move myself up here because we're moving down the chain. So 1,3-biphosphoglycerate has been phosphorylized. Um, afterwards, this is going to form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate with the help of NADH and glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase. So we have two molecules of G3P. Fantastic, we're here. We've got two molecules of G3P. However, remember when we did glycolysis, we broke into two different molecules, G3P and this DHAP molecule, if you remember. We've got to backtrack to do that again. So one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is going to use triose phosphate isomerase to form dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So now we have one molecule of G3P and one molecule of DHAP, which is great because now we can move on to the next step. Um, so the next step is to take glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, which we already formed, and then newly formed dehydroxyacetone phosphate. And we're going to take aldolase, and we're going to actually synthesize a six carbon molecule known as fructose 1,6 biphosphate. So we've taken these two three carbon molecules, and we're going to synthesize them together into fructose 1,6 biphosphate, the reverse of what we saw in glycolysis. So here's where we're gonna see the next bypass reaction. Um, over here, we form one molecule of fructose 1,6 biphosphate. And so we are going to form fructose 6 phosphate um, through magnesium cation dependent enzyme fructose 1,6 biphosphatase, um, 
or FPB ACE1, <coughs> which is going to promote the hydrolysis of the carbon 1 phosphate. So now we got rid of that one here. Afterwards, fructose 6-phosphate is transformed into glucose 6-phosphate using the enzyme phosphohexoisomerase. So we're here, and we've reached the third and final bypass reaction, or the reaction that is not the reverse of glycolysis. And this is when glucose 6-phosphate is going to be transformed into glucose or dephosphorylated into glucose. However, rather than just transferring that phosphoryl group to ADP and forming ATP, where it's going to come through a simple hydrolysis reaction. So rather than just taking an ADP molecule and attaching that phosphorus to it, making this molecule of energy, it's going to be a hydrolysis reaction um, of a phosphate ester using the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase um, to form our glucose molecule. So those are the main differences between glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. I know I flew through that. You are welcome to rewind this, re rewind this and watch it. Um, it was supposed to be a brief overview, so we're going to move on into this enzyme adelase that was mentioned multiple times um, so far. So let's look and dive into our beautiful enzyme of adelase. And so... Um, oh, I forgot to mention gluconeogenesis is regulated by glucagon, um, which is released when blood sugar is low. Um, and then phosphorylation of enzymes and regulatory proteins are triggered to push pyruvate into the gluconeogenesis um, mechanism. Back to adelase. So adelase is a cytoplasmic enzyme. It's involved in glucose and fructose metabolism. And this enzyme is going to specifically work on six reversible reactions in gluconeogenesis and glycolysis. Um, in my research, I did find that newborns had a higher level of adelase um, when they were born and as they progressed through their development. Um, sorry, I thought I heard a noise outside. As it progressed through their development, um, the concentration is going to tend to decrease until it plateaus in adulthood with little peaks here and there as you change eating habits or exercise and things like that. Um, adelase is a tetramer found in all eukaryotic cells. Um, it is a monomeric unit, has a tertiary structure that is characteristic of the TIM barrel class of proteins. Um, and it has eight alternating alpha helices in parallel beta strands. So this is the basic molecule of adelase. Um, however, there are multiple um, isozymes of adelase, so we're going to look at those in a little bit more detail. Move myself down here. Um, so adelase in glycolysis is very important. Um, as I mentioned previously, it is going to um, take apart our six carbon molecule. And so specifically, it's going to catalyze the reversible reaction of converting fructose 1,6-5-phosphate into dehydroxyacetone phosphate or that DHAP um, and the glycerol, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or that G3P. So that's where it's really important in glycolysis. It's going to take our six carbon fructose molecule and break it into two, three carbon molecules, each containing a phosphate group. Um, so it's an aldol cleavage reaction um, that takes place at the C3-C4 carbon bond in the fructose 1,6-biphosphate, um, where adelase is going to help cleave or break apart um, the molecule to form the DHAP and the G3P. Um, it also is going to catalyze fructose 1,6-biphosphate um, into phosphoenol pyruvate through the oxidative reaction. And so if we look at adelase... In gluconeogenesis, it's almost the opposite. Um, so it's going to catalyze the reduction of PEP to fructose 1,6-biphosphate. So the last slide I mentioned that it, it, adelase is actually going to um, oxidate um, fructose into PEP. Here it's going to reduce PEP into fructose. Uh, however, it's, significantly re its significant reaction is found towards the end of glu gluconeogenesis, where we take the two, three carbon molecules excuse me, um, and combine them to form the 1,6-carbon molecule, um, and it is a catalyst of this reaction. So it's the catalyst for G3P and DHAP to produce fructose 
1,6 biphosphate. And oh, I forgot to add the fructose here. Excuse me, my bad. And so they, it has the opposite effect in glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. In glycolysis, we're going to see it split the molecule apart. And in glucone gluconeogenesis, we're going to see it take two molecules and synthesize a new one. So what exactly is the regulation of adelase and what decides if it's going to break something apart or synthesize something together? Um, we're going to get to that a little later, but I want to show you the different types of adelase um, that we have, um, not only in humans, but in other um, organisms as well. So it's broken up into two main classes. I'm going to talk about class two first. Um, they are found in bacteria, yeast, and fungi, and that's all I'm going to mention about class two bacteria. Class one adelase, um, I'm sorry, class two adelases. Class one adelases are found in animals, plants, and green algae. And class one is a super family of enzymes that are further broken up into um, different forms. And so um, class one adelase has three forms, adelase A, adelase B, and adelase C. Adelase A is isolated from muscle. Adelase B is isolated from the liver, um, which automatically tells you that, okay, one's in the muscle and one's in the liver. So adelase A is probably going to be used a little bit more in glycolysis and adelase B will be used a little bit more in gluconeogenesis. Excuse me. Um, and adelase C is isolated from the brain. And it's important to note that these isozymes um, are closely related. However, um, they each have a clear and unique protein species. Um, the three forms are immunologically distinct. Um, they have different peptide maps, um, distinguishable catalytic activities, different chromosomal locations. They have um, different gene sequences. So while they are similar, um, you can tell the difference um, on, an on an immunology report. I'm going to hide myself here for right now, and then I'll move around as we get going. So, um, Adelase A um, is an enzyme that's encoded by the ALDOA gene on chromosome 16. Um, and it catalyzes the cleavage of um, fructose 1,6-biphosphate, that's a F1,6P, um, into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Um, as mentioned previously, it is found mainly in muscles and in our urethrocytes or our red blood cells. Um, and the only adelase A mutation that have been discovered um, are relatively mild, so you don't, you're not going to see a huge drastic um, phenotypic problem with a, a mutation of the adelase A gene. Um, however, um, one mutation resulted in a, an adelase A um, has been shown to cause non-spherocytic hemolytic anemia. Um, and so this mutation causes by an amino acid substitu substitution um, and it's going to destabilize the oligomeric structure of the enzyme, which is going to um, cause the shape of our um, hemolytic cells to not be spherical, as it says, non-spherocytic um, hemolytic anemia. Cause, um, concluding that anemia is actually caused by the loss of stability of the enzyme rather than the loss of the activity of the enzyme. Adelase B, um, once again, is present in the liver um, and actually possesses a very crucial role um, in fructose metabolism and gluconeogenesis. And so it has the greatest catalytic efficiency of all the adelases A, B, and C um, for both fructose 1-phosphate cleavage and fructose 1,6-biphosphate synthesis. So when we're breaking one apart and we're putting it together, adelase B has the greatest catalytic efficiency. Um, it's well suitable for its dual purpose um, of breaking apart and synthesizing um, using gluconeogenesis and glycolysis. Um, however, mutations in the human adelase B gene um, do result in a diminished or reduced adelase B activity. Um, it's actually the cause of hereditary fructose intolerance, uh, which is an autosomal recessive disease. Um, and this disease is actually going to lead to the excess levels of fructose 1-phosphate um, in our tissues, which can result in liver and kidney damage later down the line. And then adelase C um, 
if I'm being quite honest, its um, specific physiological role is hard to find and a little bit unknown and still being studied and determined. Um, we do know that it is found in the brain and other neurological tissues. Um, and it is a catalytic intermediate, so it has a little bit of catalytic properties of both Adelase A and Adelase B, but as I said, its um, physiological property is still um, being determined. And so if we look here briefly, um, just at the different shapes of Adelase A, B, and C, we can clearly see that there's a difference in shape here, um, but it's not a completely different shape. We see there are still um, tetramers, we see that they are still very large enzyme um, molecules that are being used to help um, either break something apart or put something together. I am going to focus on Adelase B here because as I mentioned, it's got this dual purpose, which is really important um, because are we either going to take two molecules and synthesize a new one like creating glucose or are we going to take something and break it apart to create some energy? And so we have to figure out how we're going to regulate Adelase B to determine what we're going to do within our body. Um, and so the um, Regulation of Adelase B um, is important to remember that it is used in both glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So really any transcription factor that can affect the balance of glycolysis or gluconeogenesis um, can theoretically regulate Adelase B um, expression as well, because if we're regulating which process we're in, we're going to regulate which um, um, we're going to regulate Adelase B expression. Um, Adelase B gene um, is exclusively expressed in liver cells. Um, or hepatocytes, proximal tubular cells within the kidney, or enterocytes. Um, it is stimulated by glucose and insulin, but inhibited by cyclic AMP. So when we see lots of glucose and lots of insulin, um, Adelase B is going to be stimulated and be um, expressed. And if we um, uh, are in the presence of cyclic AMP, it's going to be inhibited or um, stopped. And the expression of Adelase B gene um, can be regulated by several transcription factors, including that, and I'm going to butcher these names, including that of hepatocyte nuclear factor 1 or HNF1 hepatocyte nuclear factor 3, um, the CCAAT um, enhancer binding protein or the CEBP, and the D-box binding protein or DBP. Um, and these transcription factors are going to bind to specific regulatory regions of the Adelase B gene in turn affecting its expression. So depending on which transcription factor is being bound, it's going to determine um, the amount of Adelase B being um, expressed. And so HNF1 is actually a very strong transactivator, um, more so that of HNF3, because HNF1 and HNF3 actually share or compete for an overlapping binding site in which HNF1 actually binds to um, more readily than HNF3. So it's actually a stronger um, regulator and stronger transcription factor than HNF3. Um, and these are my sources. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comment below. Um, I hope you have a blessed day.